Like other parts of this course, the description of the field techniques here is necessarily introductory and basic, and if it was to be done completely would take several weeks. However, this plus the project exercise at the end of this course should give you some valuable information on how to go about obtaining some basic information on the distribution, abundance and condition of tropical ecosystems. So here's what I want to talk about. Firstly, I want to explore the question of why understanding the distribution, abundance and condition of tropical coastal, eco coastal ecosystems is important. This will then lead me on to discuss some of the fundamentals of field study design. This then will lead me to a practical uh, description of some of the technologies and methodologies used for measuring the distribution and abundance of benthic organisms, those organisms which are largely attached to the bottom of the, of the ocean and which have limited mo mobility. I will then briefly explore the methodologies used for fish and other mobile organisms and then give a brief overview of some of the physiological measurements one might take in terms of trying to understand ecosystem health. And then finally, I want to discuss a new initiative which is attempting uh, to understand global change through a series of new technologies. And these technologies are revolutionising how we look at the large-scale patterns of change and will be the basis for your field project at the last part of this course. Being able to measure the distribution, abundance and condition of tropical coastal ecosystems is crucial for their management and conservation. Without this information, natural resource managers are limited in their ability to prioritise interventions uh, which often depend on limited resources. Understanding the distribution and abundance and relating this to the condition of of ecosystems can often give very valuable clues about what might be affecting a particular coastal ecosystem and what the solutions might be to those problems. There are a number of pitfalls, however, to designing an effective field study. Uh, the first is that ecosystems can often be variable in space and time due to natural processes, making the detection of a change and indeed identifying the influence of an external factor, factor difficult. This then adds the second complexity, which is that studies need to be designed carefully in order to take care of natural fluctuations in space and time. And this is why replication and consideration of control areas are very important parts of an effective study. Replication of measurements is extremely important. Uh, for example, if one had an experimental design which had a single measurement in each of two areas, one might come to the conclusion that there was a difference when there actually wasn't. In fact, repeating the experiment with your two measurements could easily end up with a totally different result. The problem here is that you've not included the variability between studies that is often independent of whether or not there is a difference between two areas. The solution to this, of course, is to include replication of your measurements within each area by calculating the mean and standard deviation, which is essentially a measure of the variability between studies, you're able to better understand whether or not there is a real difference or not between two areas. There is an important relationship between the amount of replication and the precision of your measurement system. The more replicates you take, for example, the better the estimate you have of the theoretical mean associated with each of the two areas that you're studying. Clearly, however, the more replicates you have, the greater the time and expense of your study. As this tends to be limited at some point, there is an important trade-off that you need to consider between increasing the precision of your measurements versus the time and costs associated with increasing the number of replicates. There are a number of techniques that can help you make a decision here. Uh, one of which is called a statistical power analysis. Now, given the introductory nature of this course, we won't go any further with respect to this topic, except to say that there is an important trade-off that you need to consider in any study between the precision and the time and effort that you put into achieving it. Posing the right question is an important part of any study. 
Uh, for example, we might ask the question, what is the effect of a source of pollution on a mangrove forest? In order to do this, we might compare an area close to the source of pollution with one that's not. Now, the one that's not affected here is often referred to as the control site. However, we may need to replicate our sites within each of the two affected areas and the control site. This is because there may be variability between sites within a location, mm -hmm. and there is a risk that you don't pick uh, a representative area within each of those sites. The point here being that you need to think about uh, representative areas, the, the question you're asking, and the replication of not only between measurements, but between areas that you compare. What I want to do now is to review a couple of common methodologies which are used to measure the distribution and abundance of benthic organisms. Uh, benthic organisms, as you'll remember, are essentially fixed to the bottom of the ocean. They may be associated with mangroves, seagrass meadows and coral reefs. As has been stated before, this is an introduction to some of these more basic techniques and that there is certainly a lot to learn about uh, the field methods that go beyond what I'm going to tell you here. But let's look at some of these different methodologies. Quadrants are an important tool for ecologists and anyone interested in estimating the abundance of objects per square area uh, on a coral reef or a similar ecosystem. Now, usually involving um, a frame made out of plastic pipe, quadrants are usually of a defined size. So they may be like this one, one metre by one metre. And they often have strings uh, attached to them which cross over, and I'll get to that in a minute. Now, quadrants uh, can be laid down on the substrate, enabling an ecologist to estimate the number of objects within a certain area. Now, there are two ways in which quadrants uh, can be assessed. Uh, in one case, a diver or field technician may count the number of objects of interest uh, within the defined area of the, of the quadrant. Now, another way that quadrants can be used is to record which type of organism or substrate category appears under each of those intersecting strings. Now, once a diver or field technician has analysed a quadrant, it can be then move to another location and the process repeated. Now, there are two basic methods of using a quadrant. One method is to haphazardly lay the quadrant down across the area of interest. Another way is to lay down quadrants and put them along a tape measure or transect. Now, transect tapes are commonly made from your typical measurement tapes uh, from a hardware store, which allow uh, a diver or ecologist to set a distance over which a number of quadrants can be analysed. And commonly, transect tapes may be 50 metres or 100 metres in length, with the quadrants laid regularly along those transect tapes. Quadrants are often used with global positioning systems or GPS measurements so that they can be relocated at a later stage. And of course, that's important if you want to see whether a change has happened to a particular area or uh, uh, habitat. The GPS can be placed in a waterproof container and dragged behind the diving team. Transects can often be used by themselves to measure the abundance and diversity within tropical coastal ecosystems. One common method is referred to as the line intercept method, uh, which involves laying down a transect tape across an area of interest and then recording the length of tape associated with each different category of organism or substrate. Now, this can be a rapid and effective technology, and when combined with GPS measurements, can enable uh, repeat measurements within the proximity area over time. These measurements are usually replicated, carefully ensuring that the replicates are truly comparable in terms of the areas under study. Belt transects also tend to use transect tapes, but involve divers swimming a certain distance and counting organisms within, say, one to three metres of a transect line. Uh, belt transects allow rapid measurements to be made of usually large organisms or benthic categories. They are also useful for estimating the abundance and diversity of mobile organisms such as fish to be measured. 
There are other characteristics of coral reefs that are important to measure. Uh, one of those is the degree of structural complexity associated with a coral reef, and this is referred to as rugosity. Uh, the more structurally complex a reef, such as the one in the top uh, photograph here, the more rugose it is considered. Uh, on the other hand, a reef uh, which has low rugosity uh, has less structural complexity, and this affects the types of organisms that are able to live in those habitats. One method that ecologists use to measure the rugosity of reefs is referred to as the chain and tape method, which involves laying a transit tape across an area of interest. Now, in this case, the tape is placed so that it doesn't drape over the structures, but rather mainly measures the linear distance uh, along the area that's going to be uh, measured for rugosity. A second object, a lightweight chain, is then draped across the area, carefully placed so that it conforms to the structure of the reef, as shown in this diagram. The chain is then carefully removed and the total length of drape change divided by the length of linear distance measured by the tape. Now this ratio is referred to as the rugosity index and will be lowest in situations where there's little complexity or rugosity uh, across the benthic surface and greatest when there's lots of nooks and crannies uh, and a structurally complex surface. Take a moment now to analyse the community abundance and composition of the coral reefs in the photographs using both the line intercept method and the quadrant point intercept method. Write your answers in the space provided and see how good you are at measuring community composition and the abundance of organisms in the photographs provided.